So hello again, everyone. And uh, hi, Elliot. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from greater Seoul region. Um, so I just wanted to briefly introduce our lecturer before I give the floor um, to Elliot. Um, Elliot is uh, part of a duo called Kimchi and Chips that was founded in 2009 by Elliot and Yumi Sun. And um, their work is quite interesting because it bridges a lot of different disciplines and it kind of stands out in a kind of a dire design panorama of today's um, moment. Um, what I think is really interesting uh, and why I approached Elliot in the first place is because they really work with these kind of um, ephemeral uh, shapes and, and, and sort of time-based manifestations in space and working with a lot of kind of very ephemeral uh, states of matter. So there are works that deal with fog, there are works that deal with light, there are works that deal with um, also crucially for our research um, interest, night, the nighttime. So everything that deals with light and, and sort of transient uh, um, appearance is interesting for us. And um, they have won, Kimchi and Chips have won the award of distinction at Ars Electronica, which is quite a prestigious distinction. And um, also very interestingly uh, for us uh, all, I think is the idea that their work is also um, made open source in a way. So it's not something that lies hidden away and it kind of lives on to become uh, available to others and others can sort of perhaps build on them and uh, further, um, further, um, uh, yeah, further improve them or change them or make them evolve. And so I would just sort of pass the word on to Elliot and say once more, thank you so much, Elliot, for joining us. And we're looking forward for to hearing from you. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, I guess the funny thing about Zoom lectures is you have to dive in at the deep end, like kind of just come in and all of a sudden there's people here. You don't get to say like the uh, usual, like warm hellos and cups of coffee before you come in. Um, first thing, I'm just gonna try and see like, uh how to share this because i've got like a second screen just need to make sure it comes up correctly so let me um move things around and then we can start if anybody has any questions during the presentation then like totally fine to like just jump in and um like say you want to put your hand up and ask something um are you seeing my screen now we are Looks great. Right, okay. I can't see anybody else at all right now because <laughs> all I can see is my own slides. So um, in terms of emoting, you're very encouraged to make sounds and uh, make me not feel completely alone. Um, very well, we'll screen. do our best. We'll do our best. <laughs> okay, uh, so, um, and you're seeing just the slide, not the slide and the notes, right? Correct. Good for you, okay. Um, so our work often is um, dealing with images and I would define an image um, for the sake of this presentation as something which is uh, like a physical version of something imaginary. So you have something that's imaginary that doesn't have physical form, physical presence, and then you have the physical world. Uh, and then where those two meet is at what we could call an image. So an image being like, the physical rendition of something imaginary. Um, and there is a lot of politics around images because you can change what which imaginations are successful by changing which images are successful, which types of images are dominant in society changes the way we imagine ourselves, the way we imagine the things that we perceive. So our work is often around images and somewhat critique of existing images or offering like alternate image formats. Um, so I'm only one half of, well, there's two, two artists in the studio, me and Mimi, um, and we take turns giving presentations. We give very different presentations. Um, we don't present together because like we have um, different ways of telling the story and it's better just to kind of do one at a time. Um, so today I'm giving a presentation, but just to let you know that like there's a, another perspective on the work as well. And 
like our work is this kind of superposition of these two perspectives. Our studio, is, this is our studio um, in South Korea. So we have um, uh, like this mixed office and creation space where we do experiments and we have like a limited amount of tools and materials in order to like create prototypes of ideas or maybe like develop technologies for the projects. Um, I mean, yeah, this is a dance performance, like a little mock-up, one of the old 3D printers that we used to use. Um, and it's out in a book publishing village. So in this whole area, like all the businesses either involved in publishing books, making films, and there's, there's a couple of artists. So we're not like right bang in the center of Seoul, like in the middle of like the type of typical images of like the skyscrapers and um, super modern Gangnam districts or historic Jongno. Um, it's a little bit further out. We're actually right next to the border with North Korea. So if you stand on our studio rooftop, you can see the mountains of North Korea from, from where we are. And then we have a secondary um, space, which is uh, a fa more of a factory space. Um, I'm not sure if you're listening. Can you hear the audio now? No, not really. Because I've just turned my volume down. Does that change the sound from your side? No. no hello, hello? So. No, I don't think so. We can't hear the, the video audio. Um, anyway, I'll let this slide just go. I'll try to talk over the top of it. Um, so this is the factory space where we might build the larger works. So when something is going to production, it involves other teams, other skills. Um, it involves like storage and machinery. I'll just get off that slide. I'm not sure like how the audio is working there because um, usually in a face-to-face -face presentation, I can just do the volume control here. But I'm yeah. not sure if that works in Zoom. No. Does it just no, like... We can't hear you. We, like, we can't. We hear. We hear you. We cannot hear the video, basically. But... Oh, you couldn't hear the video, mm -hmm. right? Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Then let me just um, share my screen again, just to because um, often there's like a little option in Zoom okay. to uh, turn on. Oh, where is my share screen options? Oh, weird. Uh, stop sharing screen. Okay. Oh, so I can't see the option to stop sharing screen. So we're just going to continue without the audio, I think. Okay. Shouldn't be too much of that. Um, yeah. So um, here's an example of like a practice before it goes out and the team that is involved in uh, the production. So in the, in the kind of like um, the fabricating, we'd say, of the work. So I'm going to go to some early work just to show like where our origins were and then start to tell the story of the more recent works. So this was one of our very first projects and um, it was in response to the kind of typical projection mapping works that were coming out at the time, which was like to project a dominant graphic over a building um, and use it kind of as a projector screen, but add some shadows and, and funky effects. And we wanted to do something where actually the projector would instead have to be very um, submissive to its environment rather than dominant in its environment. So here, um, what happens is we, project into a tree and all the pixels land in quite random locations in this real tree. And then we scan in the 3D location of every pixel. And that means now we can kind of construct an image using all these pixels in known 3D points in space to create these like planes or, or 3D shapes. But then what we find is that the um, light itself releases hormones. So the uh, projector light is releasing some hormones in the tree, which is affecting the growth so over like the week exhibition, you can see the growth of the tree changing in response to like how the light is projected onto it. So we created this 
interface for people to participate in that relationship where they would be able to um, release hormones in the tree and change the growth of the tree and in a way like 3D print a tree through suggesting with um, phototropism. So a lot of people think that like we um, we do commercial projects so that it's typical for the type of studio that we are to make um, visually uh, attractive works, which then we use as a brochure for selling works in the commercial field. So we, we've never actually succeeded at that. Like we, um, we don't sell, we, we've actually like, pitched for all of these things like we even pitched for like gambling and beer and whatever and never have our projects been selected in the kind of commercial field so we're very much in like the public art field where we're making what some people might define as fine art but um i like to think of it as public art as in the client as the public um and that the relationship in the work like is to provide a service to the public even if that's commissioned through other means is still that the public themselves are the client as opposed to a secondary message. My background in physics. So um, this is like a experiment which was developed um, in collaboration with the university I went to, University of Manchester. I, I never got to this level where like I was involved in this, uh, you know, significant um, advanced level of physics. And you're probably incredibly familiar with the Large Hadron Collider because it's pretty close to where you are. Um, but um, what I was finding at the time when I was graduating was that the um, experiments were becoming increasingly incredibly complicated, um, very expensive. And meanwhile, we were making like smaller and smaller leaps in development of human knowledge, right? Like the, the, these new tools were like increasingly rarely offering us new tools of really understanding the world. Um, and I think famously the LHC was like hoping to get past the standard model of quantum mechanics, but actually all we got was the Higgs boson, which is actually kind of like not, <laughs> not so much of a success. Um, so I was really interested in how we got there and also like what the other approaches are. So if we think about like, uh, the uh, enlightenment style approach of physics where we have like Descartes, I think therefore I am, and then Newton um, making ideas which were built upon steadily layer by layer, um, you know, these kind of foundational laws of physics, and they would then be applied by higher, um, like higher order approaches later on. Um, so this, you can think of this as being like a worldview. And like a worldview, you can maybe, image a bit like this. So and a worldview is like you start with like kind of foundational ideas and then you see which ideas you can attach to that, like which ideas are compatible with that, like a seed. Um, and then increasingly you can build up larger and larger ideas until eventually like, you know, each person who's doing a PhD is like one object like attached to this big ball, but the ball's already so big that um, you're just kind of adding, you're adding things onto this perimeter and then you, you end up with this like human knowledge worldview um, or a view of the way human knowledge works. But what I found powerful about art is that art um, doesn't always try to create um, uh, consistent types of understanding um, within the singular worldview. Right? Often you can create these like bubbles of understanding which exist outside of the common worldview which are self-consistent and have a set of metaphors, which then can be interesting and applied back to reality. And that's often really how physics works in itself, that physics is about creating sets of metaphors, be particle waves, fields, and those things fundamentally, there's no evidence for those things to fundamentally exist, but they're just metaphors for thinking about the way things work. And art does the same thing. It configures sets of metaphors to create logic about the way things work. But then even further, like, well, what is a worldview? Um, so if we think about like the way we see, we can think about this as being like a metaphor for like what a worldview is. Like we have the eye, which is like accepting light from the outside. And then we have the conscious experience, which is like what we actually perceive. 
And then we have this mechanism between the two, which um, in this case, I'm just talking about the optic nerve and the optic nerve can be modeled computationally by something called an autoencoder, uh, as in like it's compressing information down to like a few nerves that travel through the center and then it expands out to the other side. But the eye therefore like throws away some information along the way to get into the optic nerve. And on the other side, there's some imagination where it takes the small amount of information that passes through and fills in all the gaps again. So usually I play a game at this point, but it's really difficult um, on the Zoom connection to actually see anybody raise their hands. Um, so I'm just gonna like play the game a little bit um, quickly. So I'm trying to guess the bandwidth of the optic nerve, like how much data travels through it. I can't see anyone's video screen, so maybe Vera, you can let me know how people react. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. I'll. Uh, okay. You guys Relate. have to put your cameras on, perhaps. <laughs> you can be. You can be my optic nerve. Yeah, there we go. Or I could I could sign in on my phone as well, and I could see. But um, oh, yeah. there are uh, some people with their cameras on. Okay, good, good. They will you, you, you and your cameras on are representing the entire group now. So. Yes, very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the game is try to guess the bandwidth of the optic nerve, um, how much data actually passes through the, the, the optic nerve to the brain. So the first one would be like the same amount of data as real player, which is this like old, terrible video format that like was very glitchy and like was a very 90s like method of, of, of looking at live video um, and that was the kind of thing you could transmit down like a, a dial-up modem the next category you can choose is a uh, blu-ray which is 128 megabits per second and that's 2000 times more and you can have like hdr 4k um, and kind of a uh, somewhat state-of-the-art image or like um, uncompressed like actually no compression whatsoever would be 18 gigabits per second, which is the communication between like a laptop and a projector. Um, so we're going to try and guess what the bandwidth is of the optic nerve. So I, maybe I can call out the different categories. And at this point, you can put your hand up if you think that it's in these different categories. Yeah, guys, I'll so, count. So please put your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so who thinks it's like dial up internet? Did we get dial anybody? I don't think anybody is putting their hand up now. Nope. Okay, who thinks it's like Blu-ray? Nobody? Nobody. It's the middle answer, so usually pick, people pick that. Um, and who thinks it's like mega high bandwidth, 18 gigabits per second? Hands up, guys. Many want two. Wait, one, two. You can see two hands. Only two hands. Okay, but can I um, answer like more? Like, I want to answer more than than answer three. Is there like another option? Like, yeah, sure, you could say yeah. more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, we've got some for answer three and some for more, right? Yeah. Um, so the actual bandwidth of the optic nerve is like ten kilobits per second. <gasps> so that's like on the previous diagram. You know, this is like way lower than even the you know, so it's 20% of the lowest answer, right? The amount of data that passes through the optic nerve is like several tweets per second worth of data. So what, what does that mean? Well, it means that like um, our eye is making an incredible amount of judgments about what it's seeing and what description to give to the brain. And on the other side, we really imagine that we're seeing all these details in the images, but it's all a neurological illusion. Reality is compressed significantly by our worldview and very thin description passes through. And then our conscious experience um, imagines the rest. So this is like a selection process of like what to pay attention to and what to ignore. And then we can think about like different kinds of art. Art which maybe maximizes the activation which results at the end of that process, right? That like could be trying to um, trying to just basically maximize the activation of those neurons. Um, and the other type could be something which is trying to show you an image which is not easily explained, described by your existing worldview. Recorded by the host, got it, okay. No audio. And then 
maybe I can actually start to see people a little bit. Great. Okay, I got my second computer up. Right. So um, we get trying to come up with like some theory about like what is like a purpose for doing art. What is the um, relationship we have with like human consciousness when we're making art? Like uh, and you know it, it could be this kind of like very um, uh, primitive uh, diagram of like trying to add in like different routes through the world view, right? Because you're showing images which um, are outside of people's general experience. And those images require a reconfiguring of the network in order for you to be able to process them. And that means that from then on, everything you see will be seen slightly differently, but also everything you remember will be seen slightly differently because your memory is also passing through the same process, this same neurological worldview. So I'm going to skip through a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to give you like a, a kind of more direct examples of these things. And now we're going to talk about like the artworks that we have, which exist within this um, uh, or, or our responses to the, these issues. So again, you can't hear the audio here, um, but, oops, sorry. Where's the volume control? I have to hear the audio, but you can't. Um, yes. <laughs> so the um, this is a work about analog television. So we can think that there was this format used to represent images um, from the Second World War until the Twin Towers fall down. History was principally being transmitted through NTSC television. That was like the biggest events in history were seen this way, you know, like in the 70s, the, uh, I think it was in Hungary where instead of taking over the capital, the protesters took over the television station. You know, history had this incredible relationship with analog TV, like TV became history and history became television. But every format has the story it's behind, behind what it's telling, and then it has a story about itself. And these two get wrapped together in the image that it shows you. So when analog television got canceled, you know, when it, or the broadcast turned off, we wanted to have this goodbye poem to that format. So here we have this installation with 483 lines on either side the same number of lines that we're representing the image. And then we fold the image in to the gallery space. So the lines are arranged in three dimensional space. And then we portray some of the non-imaging characteristics, like the things where it tells you about itself more than it's telling you about the story. So it's like the fuzz, the interference patterns, and here we're using video projectors. So we're projecting onto each string individually. So we can address all of the strings uniquely and create these image, images in 3D space with like physical volume and presence. And each string is a composite of Kevlar on the inside and nylon on the outside. So the Kevlar it's very strong, but also it has this characteristic that even if you hold it with a lot of tension for a long time, it still won't sag. So the same way like a guitar string, like you have to tune it regularly because it's kind of constantly a little bit sagging. The Kevlar never does that. So you can put this, here we have five kilograms of tension on every single string, and we're gonna hold that for 30 years without it ever sagging. So you can imagine there's two tons of pressure on each one of those plates that's holding those strings in order to keep that um, tensioned. And you can see along the center line, the video projectors. How many projectors did you need for such an installation? Okay. Um, so how's things going so far? 
let me try and look at people's faces and see how uh, stumped everybody is. If everyone's like on the right same page or, okay, <laughs> looks okay. Uh, and then in terms of like this content related to the content on your course, like, is this, um, this is all relevant and it's all kind of like in, I'll just presume the answer is yes and keep going. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Okay, so we have this kind of like, um, then we start thinking about like, what's the difference between something being image and something just being physical? Um, like, um, so we created this project, which was like creating this image of a moon, um, but trying to exist, tr trying out methods of rendering the image, which suggests that it could be real. It's not necessarily just an image. So we had this um, incinerator, Sogak Jang, in um, South Korea, where they burn the trash. They used to burn the trash, um, and it's been decommissioned. And it was this space that was going to become an art center, and previously was this industrial location. We wanted to have this rebirthing ceremony of creating this semi-material moon, that it would be something that took aspects of the digital world and aspects of the physical world and combine them together. So the way this works is we have this um, flag of fabric, which sweeps through space. And as it's moving, we have a 3D camera watching it. And that 3D camera is telling us wherever that fabric touches, comes into contact with this imaginary moon. And wherever that contact occurs, we project light onto the fabric. So over time, all of these different slices, moments, um, edges of the moon would exist independently, but over time, right? And then with the long exposure photograph, we can reveal all of those moments added together. So here, there's an effect where we're just adding the frames of the video together. So you can see that the image or the object comes together in physical space. And then using like a single long exposure photograph, you get the uh, the full detail of the image, which you can't capture it just using the video effect like this. So this project naturally was a um, photography project rather than installation, but we wanted to see like how people might capture that full moon using their own eyes, because you can kind of start to catch it even though you think of your eyes like a video camera, like they work for me, and you can kind of neurologically add up this presence in space. So like I mentioned, this was a, um, an incinerator and it was a very smelly place, right? And there's like bats and lots of uh, um, unsavory things. <laughs> so for this refreshing for it to become an art center, we, pumped in 20,000 tons of air into the building, which is then used to drive the motion of this large fabric. And then onto the fabric, we project that reaction where, where it's intersecting that moon. And you can stand out on a little balcony with a 10 meter drop down and a 30 meter uh, ceiling above you and, and watch that process happening with your own eyes. So uh, I'll talk about the next work. Um, so that, that was called Lunar Surface and that was a photography work. And partially the idea was that there was, there's often in science fiction, a second moon when you enter a second reality, like in Star Wars or Arjuna or whatever. Um, like when they're in another world, there's often like different celestial bodies in the sky. And it's an indication that you're in a new place. And, the idea that the digital world entering the physical world could be then signified by bringing this digital moon into our world. And there's a story, 1Q84 by Haruki Murakami, where uh, the main character, Idamami, enters the second reality that's like a superposition with our reality, and she sees the second moon as the signifier of that. So um, I'm going to talk now again back to images. And here is like, um, you know, very famous painting. and this era of image making of painting was significantly influenced by the introduction of a particular piece of technology. Now, this is interaction number two. Does anybody guess what piece of technology came out around this time 
which might have significantly influenced the work. Photography? What was that? Photography? Yes, yes, yes. Yay. Good class. Top marks. <laughs> right. So photography at the time was like, um, it introduced these ideas like focus, motion blur, um, a viewerless image, and therefore these new images came out. And then there was also telescopes, which were kind of a, you know, again, optics, and they brought these galaxies, images of galaxies, and this imagination changed, but also like the form of the image changed. And we're obviously living through now like another revolution in the change of the image form. Like the camera is no longer the same camera that existed then. The camera is now like, you know, it's a thinking camera, an AI camera. And every time you take a photograph, there's, you know, more operation, mathematical operations used to take a photograph and to send someone to the moon in 1960s. Um, and the algorithms make aesthetic choices about the image. So they have this idea of like beauty, drama, health, fantasy, um, or photographic talent, social importance. And they apply these involuntary adjustments to the photographs based on like the last year's worth of data. So our gaze is a machine guided gaze um, and everyday images are filtered by these historic standards of beauty. And the unusual or the outstanding is, is made by getting out of what pre-exists in these data sets. Uh, Hito style calls this the social projector, when a smartphone automatically touches up an image to remove all traces of time and achieve a platonic version of what a human should be. And cameras are changing in other ways, like there's uh, hardware changes where like they project light out into the world and they can maybe have many, many lenses and they can look at the world from many different views. So we wanted to create a work that um, reverses this process that changes a camera back into a projector, changes one of these types of new, new types of cameras into a projector. So we, we developed a method of projection where we have many um, mirrors and each mirror now acts like an individual video projector. So we take these ideas from modern photography and we, we create this new type of projector which can create a new type of image in the physical space. And rudimentary, in, like a, in a rudimentary way, if we want to um, create something in the air, create like this object of light in the air, we can turn on all of the projectors to point exactly at that point of light, at that point in the air, and we have some mist which makes that point visible. And we, you know, we found that like at first this didn't work very well, but you need more and more projectors, like hundreds of projections for this to work. So we use this quite simple material like these curved mirrors and means that like if you project onto one side of the curved mirror um the image the light is going to come out one way if you project onto the other side of the mirror the light comes out the other so therefore you can make one projector into many i'm going to skip through this a little bit um so we created three versions of this project and i'm going to show you uh the second one because um kind of my favorite. And I might also skip through this a little bit because there's a few more works to get to. So this project creates these images in the air. This is the one that was ours, Electronica. Um, and it creates this new type of image. So you can think of it as an image or you can think of it as something physical, like it's riding that boundary and the notion of the light barrier is that something that is physical cannot act like light and something that's light cannot act like something that's physical. So again, we're, we're kind of teasing like another path around the light barrier, trying to find light barrier in a different place.
skip ahead a little bit. So we're able to create these forms that have that occupy physical space. So they can move around up, down, left, right, forward, backwards. They, you can touch them. You can put your hand around one. You know, they exist out there in physical space. Because you don't get the audio, um, it might be a little bit less immersive, but um, I'll try to live with it. And then here's the third edition of the project. So this was significantly scaled up. And this time we used um, quite a simple AI system to design the, uh, the arrangement of mirrors. So we input um, where we wanted the general intensity of light to be um, and had an algorithm which would create a arrangement of mirrors facing into that zone. And then in order to optimize the parameters of that algorithm, we, we used um, a kind of self-learning system for that. And then here, again, the um, principle is the same, that you're using many projectors, this case 630, to coincide at an image in the air. And that means that at that volume in space, the intensity of light is much higher than all the approaching beams and all the beams going past it. And therefore you see that as a bright region in the air. And once you can do that with a single point, you can then create these more complicated images. And here you can see the uh, structure that was at the back. I was gonna like a little bit skip through this next section. Actually, I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to skip through it. But this is how it's made, the project. Usually, this section takes about 10 minutes to go through. But today, I wanted to get onto other projects. So I'm just going to keep going. Right. Sorry to rush, uh, but there's more content coming, so. <laughs> okay, so um, obviously these projects start to deal with this like notion of a spectacle and that we have a set of attention which has been given to us by the audience and then that gives us a new set of responsibilities, but also a um, new set of possibilities. So we have a project which we began prototyping in 2014, only in the computer. Um, and the project was to take the concept from light barrier, the, sorry, technical concept from light barrier and some of the concept from lunar surface. And instead of um, creating this moon that you can only see in a photograph, we wanted to create a moon that you could see in reality. And we'd use many, many laser projectors arranged around the city and all the laser projectors would be separated so they would coincide and we'd create the second moon over the city. And we talked to the Tokyo Olympics about this. We talked to different world expos and so forth. And um, the project didn't happen through that route. So we, um, we went ahead with like trying to create a version of the project that we could within our own means. And we use this concept called um, um, photo viz or what we call photo previs. So the idea of like trying to visualize something with photographs, in this case, we're trying to pre-visualize something like you pre-visualize a building. So we created this, like, uh, we were lucky that we could make use of this field in um, just outside of Berlin. And we had a single laser that we'd go around in this little truck. And the laser was controlled by a central computer. And we could like say, okay, we've got this imaginary moon in the air and we're gonna turn on the laser that coincides with that imaginary moon. 
And then we take a type of camera where we can stack multiple exposures onto a single film. And then we go around and we take all the different exposures for all the different laser positions. So what started out as like an idea to create this installation that'd be visible with your naked eye, turn into this uh, photography project because there was no way we could do this huge budget project. However, then last year, um, we got called up by Resolverein, which is this um, used to be the most productive coal mine in Europe. Like it was a, and it was a kind of pre Bauhaus objectivism building. And now it's a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And to us, like coal, um, coal started out like as the way in which the world was electrified. So electrification increased with coal. So the first electricity station was um, in New York City in 1882, a coal-fired power plant. And it's built like in the financial capital of the world on a street which intersects Wall Street. Um, and it was the start of the second industrial revolution, which was private capital electrification. But if we think about like access to electricity, like there isn't a universal access to electricity. You can think of it as being a bit like a wave that travels outwards from centers of capital and still hasn't like entirely um, permeated the entire planet. And that wave is generally the wave of coal. Like the first time people get electricity is generally a coal fire pump coal-fired power plant and when a lot of people complain that maybe these new countries that haven't fully got electricity yet should go straight to solar the thing is like even countries like japan are still saying we can't afford to go off coal we need to stick with coal like the coal is like much cheaper as it is right now and therefore it's still like this kind of like front wave of electrification but we need to think about like how our relationship with coal works so like our usage of power changes throughout the day, but like that has got nothing to do with like the way that power is generated by like a wind plant. The wind plant doesn't care. Like it just makes power whenever it wants. Coal, turn it on when you need it, turn it off when you don't. But wind and solar are these kind of chaotic abundance. So the uh, renewable energies have these chaotic abundance and coal has this very, um, uh, kind of like just on demand relationship. And we can try to um, like smooth out like the chaotic nature of like wind and sun using batteries or using hydroelectric dams, but they, they also have their own environmental problems also. So like we start to think like, like there's this problem, not necessarily about like the technologies and like what's available, but about like the way in which like our instincts have been trained for so long that we started to kind of like think of coal being available and being this thing which like gives us on-demand energy. And this is the mentality that needs to be unwinded. And then the other side of this, of this project is this kind of notion of spectacle, which we talk about before. So, you know, this early industrial capitalism moved the focus of existence to, from being to having, right? That was kind of this notion of like the way capitalism moved around, but it was like, not about like living anymore it's about having something it's about consumerism and there's quite nice critiques of the way capitalism emerged in this particular book society the spectacle and talks about spectacle as being this um pervasive spectacle that exists within society which disconnects us from um authentic experience and yeah there's some great quotes which like match up very well with like nfts and other modern phenomena. And spectacle has also like historically been used in quite um, violent ways. So like the Nazis with their cathedral of light had this like spectacle of light at night. And these things are being relived today. So like right-wing parties in Ukraine are reliving the Nazi spectacle of light. Um, so light and being used um, to create spectacle gives the author of that experience a power to change, to, to propagandize. Because the overwhelming nature of spectacle implies something worth believing in. 
so we wanted to create this version of the Another Moon project, which would be a little bit aware of this history. Um, so first of all, it would try to unpack the supply and demand relationship with energy. So it would be very submissive to energy and to nature and to the audience. And therefore, you know, try to unpack some of the issues of spectacle also. So we construct the installations, this ring of towers that collect sunlight during the day, and they project that sunlight back into the sky at night. So they can replay that fragile energy of the day. And each solar panel then acts a bit like a pixel, like recording the passage of the clouds. Every tower acts independently without any wires. And we can't control how long the exhibition lasts for because it's just however long the batteries last for, however much sunlight there was. And then the light from all of these laser projectors then is calibrated together to make the second moon in the sky. And you can see the installation from up to a kilometer away, depending on conditions. So it acts as a kind of inviting beacon to see on the landscape. And then you can come underneath it and be inside of this structure. You see here like a time-lapse video recorded. From this angle, it's not particularly well calibrated, which is why it doesn't overlap perfectly. But from the second angle, it looks a little bit better. And you can see the clouds passing through it, which act as the fog. Oh, wait, I found my controls. There we go. So here's the coal plant in the background and the 40 laser projectors which together draw the second moon in the sky. Go skip to the final shot. And then this shot, you can see the um, you'll see some of the lasers individually turning off. So when the battery power for each one goes, they just turn off by themselves. You see some of them starting to go. And then the moon, the moon just disappears as the energy of the day has been depleted. And if it's been a cloudy, rainy day, there's no moon that night. If it's been a really sunny day, then there'll be a really strong image and which will last for a really long time. So what you might have noticed between a lot of these projects is like the topic of the course, um, a lot of it's happening in the dark, right? Like we're acting in the dark. And one of the issues of being in the dark um, for us is that the audience can't fully believe it. They often feel like they're in an environment that we have control over. So we can perform magic tricks and we can hide, conceal the way things work. Often it's using all this technology, which like people can't see the insides of. So maybe people might feel like it's magic and different from their everyday experience. And therefore we're not really interacting with their everyday experience. So we wanted to make works also, which like exist in the daylight with the public, right? Like, like another moon is with the public, but in a way which like can just be seen face to face without any kind of apparent technology happening. The first project sketch for this was in 2016. And the general concept is to use um, mirrors to redirect sunlight. So we have this array of mirrors. Um, this is a prototype, not the real one, and some mist. And then each mirror then is able to draw a line of sunlight in the mist, right? So we can then have this capacity to draw lines in mist by aiming this array of mirrors. And if we align enough of these lines along tangent of a circle, then we could create this circle out of sunlight. So we'd be creating this image of the sun, but out of sunlight. So first of all, we have to think about these, um, uh, these mirrors because the mirrors have to move. So a moving mirror that tracks the sun is called a heliostat. So it has to be a robotic mirror platform, including servo motors. It has to be waterproof, has to work in a network. It should be electricity efficient, has to be shipped around for exhibitions also. So we developed this heliostat system um, and then 
produced a large set of them, but this is like maybe the fifth or sixth version. So you can kind of see at the end of this video, the graveyard of previous versions, which all failed to, or kind of were part of the progress of getting to the final result. And there are lots of um, historical precedents for uh, trying to work with images of the sun or taking uh, the geometry of the sun and improving our knowledge of the world. Um, I'm going to skip through a little bit because we are late on time. Um, and these works take a lot of labor. So often when people ask us like, you know, what, to, what kind of artist are you? You know, are you a painter or a sculptor or something like this? I can say like we're a production artist because like really the main material we use is production. You know, we physically make things, we coordinate teams, we plan shipments, we um, perform structural analyses. You know, like it's the main medium we use is production more than anything else, right? These things are not just the means to the end, they are, they are the artwork. You know, they're one of the principal ways in which it interacts with the work. So after 17 months of working on the project, we finally got to the point where we could calibrate sets of mirrors together and start drawing controlled beams into the air. But what we can notice here is that like, even though we thought the sun might be the dominant force, something else comes into the picture, which is the wind. So, we need to get this even distribution of mist in the air in order for the lines to become visible. But the wind will just keep on constantly blowing this around. So we started to think, what if we could collaborate with the wind? So we'd blow the mist inwards from many positions outside and let the wind drift it in so that it would become this cloud. And we tried out different particle sizes, which were affected by wind in different ways and uh, different uh, uh, configurations of nozzles. And eventually like it, by using very, very fine mists, we're able to use a very small quantity of water, but we have to ha use a very high pressure in order for that to work. So the amount of water that's used per day is the same as to make one cheeseburger. And again, like these works are like team works, like a lot of different people have to apply their problem solving skills to realize the production. You know, there's a lot of metal working, testing, working things, aligning axes, testing servo motors, finishing. This is the axis tests, wiring, and packing for shipping. So eventually we showed the work in Somerset House in London first, and then at the National Museum of Contemporary Art in South Korea second. And the work has this longer term relationship with the public where they might see it every day because it's on their way to work. And they might only see it once because like they didn't expect to, didn't plan to, or maybe they came to the city just to see it. Because we can't predict when the image will occur, people would come back again and again and again. Every day, the sky is different and what is rendered is different. Every second, the wind that's in the air is completely chaotic and without our control. So we can't recreate any of these halos after they've occurred once. So again, it's like against this like notion of on demand that something could be supplied whenever you want it. It's not scheduled, it's always waiting, it's always working, but if you want to see the result, it takes a lot of patience from the audience. 
And we can see those results through like Instagram, like how other people were viewing the work. But also, you know, if it's not sunny, then you get this kind of effect, the uh, just like some mist in the wind, because the extra humidity in the air from the clouds causes that mist to become the mist to become very dense. It becomes a sort of fog sculpture, visualizing the air movement. And in those cases, like the disappointed people could come and see the story of like how the project works and what relationships are being set up and the precedent with the previous works. So eventually this image, the halo is lit by the power of a hundred suns. You've got the 99 reflections and the single sun directly shining into it. I took a long time to learn how to collaborate with these natural elements, but practicing that collaboration with nature and reality um, gives an authenticity to the work that there's something found in it there's not something synthesized. Um, yeah, and then I do have one more work, but I think I might stop there time-wise. We've hit one hour already. It might be a good time to move to questions. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Elliot. Um, don't know if no worries. Okay, where's my stop sharing? Stop sharing thing if you can't, maybe I can. Yeah, you tell there me. we go. I see it's hidden. So back to uh, back to gallery. Back to everybody. Hey everybody. So thank you so much, Elliot. I'm gonna stop recording right now, and we're gonna uh, go on towards a more sort of informal discussion. Invite everybody to turn on their cameras.